um, to be able to help out our students with academic programs and academic support. Um, but I'm just looking forward to be able to also support our, our teachers the way that they need to be supported. Um, I was a teacher myself uh, for many years, uh, for six years now. Um, and this year I am finishing off um, almost, almost there to finish off the year as a third grade math teacher with North Central. So thank you for joining us today. Awesome, thank you, Gabby. Um, and Ursa already introduced herself as well so that everybody is aware. Um, I am now recording this. I meant to record it from the beginning, um, but that way people can have access to it afterwards. Because um, as I said, we do want to answer your questions and everything like that. So um, we have a great question. Um, will this camper campus offer a dual language program and how does that work? So at our campus, um, foreign language will be starting in grade five. Um, that foreign language in grade five is Latin. They take that for grade five and grade six. Um, foreign language in those grades is a really important part of that. Latin in particular is set up to be able to really help the kids um, with actually a lot of academic language and um, in particular with the foundations of grammar um, as it relates to English. In grade seven, students then move forward um, and they pick a foreign language between Mandarin, French, um, Spanish and Latin. So they ch they choose that language in grade seven and they will continue that through their high school experience with us, um, which does lead me to make sure that I mentioned that our campus, although starting K through five, um, we will at our campus grow to be a full K through 12 facility. Um, during our second year, we are planning on building a second building um, that will be for our middle and high school students. Um, and so that full K through 12 experience for your students will be available on our campus. Um, but as far as a dual language program, we do not have that. Um, in particular, in the younger grades, we do not have that. We have the opportunity to be able to um, offer a science literacy course during um, during the school day. That science literacy course is something that I know all four of us are very excited about. Um, it was something that as a network, we noticed a, a need for students to be able to learn how to read about science and write about science because they use that in all fields. Um, as I mentioned, Stephanie was a history teacher. You know, me as a math teacher, it's easy to be like, yeah, they need to learn how to read and write about science. But Stephanie as a history teacher was pointing out like, they read graphs and things like that all of the time in courses like history. And so being able to connect, how do you read about it and write about it um, is super important. And so we're excited to be able to offer that course. It's going to allow our students to be able to do a lot more hands on science activities as well. Um, and then as far as foreign language offerings, um, there is a good potential that we will be able to offer um, some opportunities as an extracurricular opportunity for our students, whether that's American Sign Language or we have a number of teachers um, who are bilingual in, in other languages as well. Um, Adrian asked, hello, if I have a current third grader that didn't take the STAR test this year due to COVID, when will they take it? Um, I'm going to try and let Gabby answer that question, assuming her microphone is working because she is the director of academic programs, so assessments is really her area. And if she's not able to, then I'll jump in and answer that one. Doesn't look like Gabby's is working, so I'll go ahead and answer that one. So Texas canceled the star test for this year. Um, so as far as that um, state accountability, students will not need to be making up those star tests um, within any, any amount of time. They will the next year. So um, Adrian, I'm assuming if he's in third grade, your student's going to be in grade four next year. Um, he will take the fourth grade star next year, um, but there is no there is no makeups of the star exams, um, particularly in the younger grades. So um, that brings up the other point that we do as a network. Um, we do take state tests. Um, we are part of the the state accountability um, and everything like that, which is where those those rankings of number one in Bear County um, do come from is the TA. It's based on those star assessments. Um, but they will not need to make that up. But our students do take the star and our students do really well on that, not because we focus on the star assessment, but because we focus on 85 minutes or 50 minutes of great teaching, depending on the class. Um, and then BR asked, how many classes or teachers do you have per grade? I have twin incoming kindergartners and ideally would like them in separate classes. I fully support you in wanting them in separate classes. In most instances, separating siblings is a good idea for both of them. Um, it does come down to that. 
responsibility and accountability and really developing individuality. Um, so in kindergarten right now, we are looking at um, three um, different classes of kindergarten um, or four, but we're really looking at three right now. So um, we absolutely would be able to separate them. Um, as far as how many teachers do you have per grade? So in kinder through grade three, um, we use a two teacher model. Um, that two teacher model in kindergarten is um, a lead teacher and a teaching fellow, both degreed professionals who are experts in early child education. Um, and so they really team together to to work together. So we typically have about 30 students with two teachers, so a 15 to one ratio there. Um, in grades one through three, that two teacher model is a learning expert teacher um, and a subject expert teacher. So the the learning expert teacher travels from class to class with the students, um, really focuses on um, the pedagogy of, of primary education um, and child development, and then looks at ways to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all the students. Um, the subject expert teacher is the one who, um, as Gabby mentioned, she was a math subject expert teacher. Um, and then we have humanities subject expert teachers. Those subject expert teachers are experts in what they're teaching, and so they will teach just math and they have a passion for math and that allows them to focus on the curriculum. The LET focuses very much on the students and they work together to meet all of the needs of the students. So it's not exclusively focusing on one. They co-teach all of those classes. Um, it allows them to do a lot of small group work during every lesson and everything like that. Um, in grades four and five, those subject expert teachers again transition. You know, we've got doctors um, of, you know, in various fields teaching fifth grade science or fifth grade classics. Um, but yes, we will be able to put your twins in separate classes. That is not a problem. <laughs> um, Adrian asked, is cursive taught and are spelling tests given? Um, simple things, but important to our family. Yes, indeed. Um, looks like Gabby's back on. So again, it's a curriculum question. I'll give her a chance to go ahead and answer that, but I'm not sure if her, hey, it looks like it's working. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, I had to exit and come back in and hopefully that worked. Um, thank you for the question. So is cursive taught in our spelling test given? Um, so that is uh, with our curriculum, right? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that you're, think, you're, you're talking, I know you mentioned before that you had a third grader. So I'm assuming that's the, the curriculum you're talking about. Um, cursive is in our curriculum. Um, it is just, uh, we don't have a specific uh, program that we use, but I know, um, so for example, I was a third grade LET, just like uh, Chris mentioned before, and that year we definitely used, um, we had a program that we used with our students and we taught them cursive. We used that in humanities. Um, and so we use that as part as a, um, on a Friday type of uh, schedule. And so the kids were able to have that, um, the capability to, to have those skills um, because like you, I mean, I do think that is important. Um, with spelling tests, um, that really depends on the way that the teacher really does want to do it. I can tell you, uh, first graders, they have spelling tests and second graders. Um, I have a first grader myself at this moment um, with basis as well. And she has, even through distance learning, she is taking spelling tests. So, um, so yes, all of those things are definitely um, still part of the curriculum and how the teacher wants to implement them. It's really, um, you know, the beautiful thing where where our teachers get that, you know, that that freedom to be able to teach it the way they want to. Um, and whether that test is going to be on a formal test or if it's going to be on a program like Kahoot or something, you know, that's that's a fun thing that teachers get to do as well. Yeah, and I think to Gabby's point, I think that's one of the wonderful things about the um, basis curriculum and, and kind of teaching within the basis curriculum is yes, we have a shared curriculum. Um, and so Gabby and I were actually talking yesterday um, about, you know, two step equations because she's a math teacher and I was a math teacher. And so I was like just talking about it. She's like, oh my gosh, that's what I taught today. And we were, but how we go about teaching that particular skill to our students is up to the teacher. And that allows a lot of freedom and a lot going back to that passion of the teachers man, it comes across when you're able to implement the curriculum in, in the way that it works best for your students um, and at the timing and pacing that works best for your students too. So we all share the same curriculum, but that implementation of that curriculum is really at the heart of student success. Um, and so being able to do that with what works best for your students. Um, and that goes directly to the next question that we have from Drew, which is 
how do you assess the skill set of individual students, um, particularly students that may have previously attended basis and everything like that? Um, so again, I'll let Gabby touch on a piece of that because it's about assessment and then I will jump in and talk more because it's one of my favorite things to talk about how we meet the needs of the kiddos because I'm sure Stephanie will jump in and talk more about that too. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, so Drew, um, so he's an incoming first grader and absolutely I, I, I can um, absolutely understand the, you know, the, the how worried you may be about that. Um, so one of the things that we do in the beginning is that we have different uh, forms of assessment that we have in the beginning, in the middle of the year, and then at the end of the year. And it's just also a way for us to make sure that our students are growing. Um, that first test that we take in the in the fall, in the beginning of the year, it really helps us identify those gaps and identify anything that our students may be lacking where we can place them on different uh, different forms of academic support, whether that may be if they are on an intervention program, that is something that we will do, um, and that the LET will be instrumental to being able to do. Um, the SETs can obviously as well be able to help out, especially when it comes to those classrooms um, in the classroom while they're teaching something specific and they know that there's something that there was a gap for that student. You know, those small groups, the, the ability to have two teachers in the classroom and pull a small group um, of those students that are, are maybe lacking some of the foundational skills. It, it serves, um, you know, just it just helps so much to be able to do that uh, with those students. But then also dedicating some time throughout the week, whether it's a it's a more um, you know, planned type of program or approach, whether it's a 30 minute or a 20 minute every three days or every couple of days for three days a week, something like that would be done. And so if we see a if we see something is missing, we will definitely make sure that we help out, obviously keep you in the loop, uh, parents, and make sure that parents are aware that this is something that we will be doing or that we will be um, practicing with their students or with their child um, this is where Stephanie and I will be working very closely together to make sure that parents are um, aware and that they um, have basically a good um, a good knowledge of what is being done with the student, how is their growth being um, you know measured, and um, at that point also you know can we move them into different things where they may not need as much support later on. Um, so that is definitely something that we will do. Um, I can tell you for my third graders. Um, in the beginning, something I did and I implemented in myself um, in my classroom was um, just a benchmarking, you know, in the beginning, just to see what their skills were like in the uh, just to know what do they know already coming in. And it helps the teacher um, as an SET to kind of see, you know, where the students stand. I knew that I had so many, I had very high kids and I had some low kids and I had some kids that were exactly where they needed to be. And so I if all of my lesson planning went to that. All of those kids, how can I push those kids higher? How can I keep those kids challenged? And how can I support those kids that need that additional help? So it definitely can, um, you know, teachers will know how to help their students um, for sure when it comes to that. Yeah, I think it really Chris, anything is. else that you want to mention? Uh, uh, there is, but I'm going to let Stephanie go first because I think it really is about meeting the needs of each individual student, um, whatever those needs may be, whether it's pushing them or supporting them. Um, but I'm going to let Stephanie talk more because I know this is an area of that's really close to both of your hearts. So go ahead. Yeah, I love working with our academic support um, program with the teachers and with the students. Um, something to keep in mind is that we are a new campus opening in a new part of town. And while we will have some existing basis students, a lot of our kiddos will be new to the basis system. And so our teachers will be scaffolding the material and order to get them where they need to be. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. We're not expecting them to come in and as if they've had kindergarten at a basis school. Um, another thing is that all students have access to some form of academic support. Um, our teachers do offer what they call student hours. It's similar to like an office hour if uh, you're on a college campus, but basically students can come in um, one day after school um, for an hour and they can ask questions that they might have. They can um, get a little bit more individual support from the teacher. Um, I know as a teacher myself, when I taught seventh grade, I would bring in like ninth graders who had me in the past who would come in and tutor students 
students. So that might be something that we can think about like in the future when we have that program K to 12. Um, but really it's just about supporting the students in the best way possible um, and to meet all of their needs. Um, in, fourth and, in fourth and fifth grade, um, they won't have that learning expert teacher in the classroom. So that is where myself as the director of student affairs will kind of come in and help support students. Um, sometimes we figure out that, you know, without that extra guidance in the hallways, their lockers in fourth grade become a little bit of a mess. And I have dug through lockers with kids and become very sticky and um, found all of their homework. And it's not just about finding the work and organizing their locker, but then taking them to teacher to teacher and asking that teacher if they will accept the work late. Um, because it's about, again, taking accountability of my locker was a mess. I found this assignment. I have a missing assignment. Can I please turn it in? And to get that skill as a fourth grader is just so important because they learn how to advocate for themselves with adults guiding the process. They don't go to middle school and like feel like they're too afraid to talk to their teachers, which is really cool. Um, so again, all students have access to academic support, especially our first year. We're going to know that we've got students who need help adjusting um, to the basis way, especially when they've been out of school for five months at that point too. So um, we'll have a lot of focus on behavior expectations as well as academic expectations. Um, Chris, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you at this point. No, thank you. Um, I think the locker example is a perfect example of a lot of the other things too, is that those are, um, in a lot of ways, those are expected challenges. Those are learning, we, and we don't view that as a negative. That's, that's a positive, that's a learning opportunity for that student to be able to learn, how do I start to get that organized? It's it's natural that as the students gain a little bit more freedom, that they may struggle with some of those areas of that. And so knowing that that's part of what we um, anticipate and go through. Um, going specifically back to some of the assessments that we use to make sure that we are, um, you know, finding out where students are strong, where they're struggling a little bit. Um, in particular, we use a program called FastBridge, which is a screener um, that's nationally normed um, to allow us to be able to really um, kind of pop any red flags as far as early literacy and early numeracy skills. Um, it covers reading fluency and reading comprehension as well um, in grade one. And so that is one of the things that we do very early on, um, in particular to first grade. Um, in some of our older grades, we also use internal baseline tests or BLTs. We love acronyms at basis. Um, and so in the other grades, we use those as well to kind of target. Um, but then formal and informal assessments are very much a part of our culture. Um, so there are formal assessments um, with students and those aren't just, you know, they're never gotcha moments. They are always opportunities to figure out where are students at? Do we need to focus on more? So as far as some of those um, particular formal assessments and then informal assessments constantly being done, whether it's through warm ups, whether it's through exit tickets, checks for understanding, using whiteboards during the class, um, things like that. So we are actively assessing exactly where the students are at um, through a bunch of informal methods through that process. Um, and then also in our younger grades, um, we do use reading A through A to Z um, to really figure out where the kids are at reading level wise to make sure that we're able to target any needs. Um, and also really importantly to be able to provide any um, enrichment or intervention that's needed there. Um, hopefully, Drew, that answered your question. Obviously, all three of us love talking about that particular topic. So hopefully that answered your question. And if not, we're happy to talk more. Um, so Adrian is wondering, I'm glad you feel better, Drew. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, I'm going to address that more in just a second. So Adrian, um, Adrian's asking, how does the basis curriculum compare to Common Core? So that's a great question, too. So when you're talking about our curriculum, I think what's important to note to note is that there are national kind of science standards or national math standards that aren't necessarily um, requirements nationally, but that are recommended from like the National Council on for Science and Math and things like that. Um, so there are those ideas where here's what you're covering. There is the Common Core, which is adopted by a large number of states. Um, and then there are our Texas standards, so the TEKS. Um, our curriculum does include all of the TEKS, so it includes all of the Texas standards. It also includes a lot of other standards, um, oftentimes at a level that is higher than 
um, what would be expected either in the state of Texas or nationally. Um, so introducing students to um, science literacy is a perfect example. That is not something that's normally even approached until middle school, um, and we're teaching it in first grade. Um, you know, and so things like reading comprehension, we're often teaching those standards at a younger level. Um, our history content I mentioned earlier is taught at a very high level. And so it is tied in as far as whether it's the Common Core Standards or the TEKS, which are very similar in a lot of ways. Um, those are tied into our curriculum. We do make sure that we are covering all the Texas standards, but we cover other things as well. And then even with those TEKS, we often are covering them at a younger grade level. Um, that's also part of the reason why our students do so well on um, the Texas standards based tests, the STAR exam. Um, and then Drew, just following up, um, until they feel the support system in place at basis will be a tremendous help to our family. I think that's going to be a tremendous help to a lot of families, Drew. Um, you know, I think it's it's really it's one of the special things about the two teacher model. It's one of the reasons why we have, um, you know, Gabby and Stephanie there to support the students and to support the teachers in supporting the students. Um, it, it really is. And then the, the student hours that Stephanie mentioned, too, I think the the support systems that are in place at basis, in my experience, are unparalleled anywhere, whether it is um, a traditional public school or, as I said, I, I worked in an area where there was a lot of private schools um, and the support systems that we have in place are far and away more comprehensive than the support systems that are in place, even when you're paying $30,000. So um, I fully agree with you and I know it's at it's very much at the heart of, of one of the things that, that Stephanie, Gabby and I care very much about. Um, again, please feel free to unmute. I know I keep talking, so it's hard to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question out loud, but um, by all means, please unmute yourself if you have a question or please continue entering them in the chat box. It's up to you all. I apologize, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so the, um, what, what would be the experience like for an incoming first grader uh, <clears throat> obviously you know it seems like there's some uh, dates that that uh, give them the chance to I think there was a like an email for a swag shirt and all that good stuff and and getting uh, I guess meeting uh, some sort of meet and greet or down the line but um in, in terms of the curriculum I, I you know the, the information was good uh, in terms of like the the assessments that are done in the class and all that but um, I guess overall experience for an incoming first grader, um, you know, what, what can you what can you kind of give us there um, in terms of what you guys expect, and then how much parent involvement is expected as well? That is a fantastic question. Yeah, that that transition experience, per and I think again, Stephanie mentioned earlier, coming back to the students haven't been. Um, you know, they've all been learning. I'm sure that you all are working hard, but um, haven't been in a, you know, academic, the normal academic setting for five or six months. Um, Stephanie, I'm going to let you go ahead and take this one first because both the foreign of the community, the, the culture of the community, and then also I know you love boss camp. So <laughs> <laughs> I definitely love boss camp. Um, so students will be able to kind of get a preview to um, what school will be like through what we call boss camp in the summer. It's a week long camp where they um, learn how to use their cubbies. For example, you have a first grader. Um, they'll learn about, um, you know, basically the expectations of basis and it really gives them a chance to get used to the school building. Um, they get to meet their administrators. They get to meet some of their teachers. And so it's just a really good way for them to feel comfortable with that first drop off on the first day of school. Um, we will also have the opportunity for students to come in during welcome week and like meet teachers. Parents will be allowed on campus at that point and be able to go in and look at classrooms. And, um, you know, if they're fourth or fifth, they'll be potentially assigned their lockers. And so they can get their schedule, look around, kind of see what's going on in the building. And that helps our students feel more comfortable. Um, as far as like social emotional growth, for example, um, we do have a social emotional curriculum. Teachers will be teaching that curriculum once a week within the classroom and then reinforce those same ideas throughout the rest of the week. Um, parents, um, you guys can also reinforce those skills at home too. Um, if your student is, you know, maybe 
really excelling in that social emotional growth, um, then they will be you know, leaders in their classroom, which is fantastic and somebody for their students, for other students to look up to. Um, and if they are struggling, then, you know, that's something that I really do want parents to partner with me um, about. When it comes to behavior management, I mean, I've got my toolbox, but sometimes parents will give me more information about what works at home. And I want to partner with you guys to make sure that the expectation for behavior is met at school. Um, parent partnership is super important basis, whether it be in academics or whether it be um, for behavior management, um, you, you won't be wondering what's going on with your student at school. Um, we do also take a big piece of student accountability and communication. So, you know, starting in kindergarten, they have what we call a curriculum journal or communication journal or CJ, um, where, you know, notes home to student or to parents will go from the teacher. Um, if there is something more, um, if there's something more serious that occurs throughout the day, then you will get a, a phone call from somebody to let you know, obviously. Um, but we do want the student to take that responsibility to communicate um, information home and again, kind of put that accountability on the kiddo and just help them feel comfortable like they're in charge of their education when they get to take like a really good note home to mom and dad that comes in their CJ because again, they were a leader or role model for social emotional curriculum or they did really well on an assessment. Um, they get to communicate that to you guys too. Um, Chris, is that? Yep, um, and I think I think I think that's one of the big pieces when you're talking about how to the transition as students are coming into our program. Um, is I think you'll see very quickly, um, you know, within a couple of weeks, within a couple of months, um, the student your your um, child all of a sudden taking starting to take ownership and pride in what they're able to take ownership of with their curriculum. Um, as far as kind of continuing with the boss camp and stuff like that, so that boss camp is the week of July 27th. Um, and so it is right now we're looking at the morning um, during the week of July 27th. More information about that will come out um, as we get closer. Um, but then in addition to that, we also have a um, welcome week, which is back to school time, um, a couple of days, um, chance to come in, um, really explore the building, get to meet the teachers who will be in their classrooms working on finishing setting them up. Um, pick up the school supplies if you ordered them through Educate, and then um, also really get their schedule and you get to drop off first day pack and everything like that. Um, that experience gives you a chance to really just kind of go around the building, meet all of our staff and everything like that. Um, we are looking at a number of different options for what that looks like, depending on where the recommendations are for social distancing and everything like that. So if we're able to do it where everyone can come in, um, we're definitely planning right now to separate out the times a little bit so there's some fewer people coming in, um, but it's a chance to come in, see the classroom, experience that and everything like that, even if you're not able to do the boss camp um, and come in through that part of things. And then even on the first day of school, like we have all hands on deck to make sure that the kids are able to get from the car into the classrooms and things like that. Um, so that transition the kids do very, very well with. Um, but I think Welcome Week is a great chance. If we're not able to do that in a everybody coming in, then at the very least there will be an opportunity for um, still an opportunity to come in. We'll also be doing um, live school tours as soon as um, we are able to, meeting both the CDC recommendation and more importantly, our building has to be completed, um, which will be happening sometime in the next you know, month to two months. Um, and so as soon as we're able to start doing live tours, we're going to open that up as an opportunity for people to sign up. Um, so I'll be doing those very frequently once our building is open. Um, Liz said, question about school supplies. What would happen to the school supplies if we order online and the school um, isn't able to open up bricks and mortar? So great question. So um, we did partner with Educit for school supplies. It really is a Definitely now where it's going to save you, you know, you're not going to have to go out and it helps you social distance and everything. Like that. It's also cheaper, frankly. Um, so it's one kit. You go online, you press the button and boom, your school supplies for your kiddos are ordered um, for the entire year, both the individual supplies they need and then the community supplies for things like colored pencils that they share in kindergarten or, you know, tissues, things like that. So it's all part of one boom, click, you're done. Um, but as far as what happens, so if we um, we would do a pickup, so the students would be able to come by and get their school supplies because they're boxed individually with the student name on them. So they would get their school supplies. Um, they would pick up their CJ and their communication journal because even if we are distance learning, that communication journal is part of what we want the students doing. Um, it's one of the foundations of that student accountability piece. Um, 
get their schedule so that they know who their teachers are. We'll also have it set up so that, um, and again, that's if we have to go strictly distance learning, which we're hoping the very least, um, we're hoping for the best, but even if we have to do a hybrid model, um, we're hoping to do those things um, in person. But even in those situations where we would have to do distance learning, we would make sure that there's an opportunity for you to um, come by, pick up the stuff, meet the teachers um, in that fashion would be able to at least see who they are, say hello so that they can start building that community. And then that will be a focus, whether it's um, bricks and mortar, whether it's a hybrid or whether it's distance learning, building that community of students is going to be a big focus of those first couple of weeks of school. Um, if you don't mind, um, if can, do you mind elaborating a little bit more on the uh, distance learning so that way if we need a plan uh, as parents for for contingency if that if this were to happen again um, if you can just kind of give us a breakdown of of the day of the curriculum kind of of what what is and what is expected from the student or what a student can expect um, you know for so like right now um, my daughter probably gets uh, somewhere in between 45 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes of of uh, class time every every morning. Um, so if you can kind of give us an idea of, of of what I guess what the current students are 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 doing uh, at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great question because. Again, if school is three months away, we really don't know where we're going to be. So I think it's best to talk, you know, when we're talking distance learning. Um, I, I think, like I said, our network's done a great job. I'm going to let Stephanie and Gabby jump in on this first, um, partly because Gabby has been actively teaching at the distance learning as well as having children learning it. And then Stephanie has continued with her academic support for those students um, via distance learning. So I want them to be able to address what they've been doing. And then I will add in some pieces as well for our particular campus that we'll know we'll need to do at the beginning of the year. Gabby? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, I am I am finishing out the year as a third grade math and science SET, and it really has been, you know, obviously challenging, but at the same time, um, some of the things that we're doing in the classroom, um, you know, virtually is, is, is really, um, you know, fulfilling in the way that we get to meet every week. Um, one thing that I am doing is I am providing live classes for my students. And so, for example, this was our last week. Uh, this week was our last week of content, and then we're moving into project week next week, but um, which is to totally separate that we can talk about <laughs> later. Um, but um, we are, you know, we I, I basically what I did because we it was our last week is that I, I allowed them or I made sure to have uh, our two sessions of of math as a live class um, for the because of the fact that we had, you know, our, our last few months. Uh, in distance learning, we really did want to make sure that our, our curriculum was in a way where we were able to give the students everything from the different classes that they have so that, you know, I knew that there was no way I could give them, you know, all of the math content that we usually would be able to do in a classroom setting, right? Like they usually would get about five lessons from me um, in math class uh, for our Saxon curriculum, and then they would get something from science. And, uh, you know, thinking about that there's just no way that we can expect that uh, for our students and for our parents to be able to do um, at home but everything that was presented to them was done in a way where whether it was pre-recorded lessons that gave them you know that basically went through the whole lesson and the way I did it I can tell you from my experience um, I, I would present them with my regular presentations of like PowerPoint which is how we did our classes in the either way um, you know and it has a my, my video and they can see me and they can you know talk to me um, or I can talk to them and and kind of have the same interactions there with them um, the assignments are given to them a week in advance but then again like I said, this is something that is it's school to school and we would decide what would be best for our community and for our students, whether that is um, setting out everything on a weekly basis or on a daily basis. That is definitely something that we will be working, um, you know, if if it comes to that point where we are going to be doing this distance learning. Um, but know that, you know, teachers have been so creative. Um, I have been just, you know, blown away because not only am I a teacher, a third grade teacher myself, but I have a third grader um, at home and I have a first grader at home and seeing the content that is being provided to them from the rest of the teachers has been, you know, just amazing to be able to witness and to also be able to help them out at home. Um, 
the student, my kids are able to do that on their own. Um, my third grader is at least my first grader with a little bit of help. Um, you know, I, I assist her with some of the things, but she has uh, definitely become very uh, self-sufficient with those things. She already knows she will get her notes ready. You know, she'll do all those kinds of things, which are things that we really want to be able to implement next year, especially like how Chris mentioned, our CJs are really important for us. That tool is something that we believe in. And so it's something that we would want to implement. Um, but I have teachers that have done things like on Quizlet or things on, you know, using outside sources too, um, and outside um, applications like Quizlet or like um, um, different types of applica different types of websites that can help them also with, um, you know, more interactive things to do, um, as well as hopefully having a way to for students to be able to see us and for us to be able to see students, because obviously that is what we're going to be able to need to build that relationship with them and, um, you know, still be able to have that with them and how we would be able to do that through this. I mean, obviously we know that would be the challenging part, um, as we know, already the challenge that this meeting is right not being able to be in person and be able to see your faces um that that's that's where that's where we're going to try to you know try to meet those needs of the students um and then stephanie i know you'll want to jump in and talk about the academic support that we are still doing even though we are um you know doing this distance learning that is still happening for our students that need that help absolutely yeah, most definitely. Thanks, Gabby. Um, so academic support looks different from distance learning because there are so many other factors um, and it kind of shifted throughout this whole process. Um, like we said, there was a turnaround of like three days before BASIS started putting out curriculum for our students after the shutdown was announced. Um, and with that, um, my job was to start calling families, make sure they had access to technology. Um, I became like an IT person and was like sitting on the phone with the student and the parent teaching them how to use our platform, which is Microsoft Teams. Um, and then sometimes I would, it really just depended. Um, sometimes I would set up weekly calls with the parent. So I just reach out and speak to the parent directly once a week to make sure that everything is still going well on their end. I have a few students in fourth grade who I taught how to use Teams and I'm so proud of them because they make it to my uh, academic support meetings like two to three times a week on their own. They log in, they give me a rundown of everything that they're missing. Um, they tell me what their plan is to get caught up. They tell me that they did really great on their tests. They tell me about their weekend plans. And so that's been so fantastic to see their growth um, from students who could barely navigate a laptop um, at nine years old, which is completely understandable to being able to like come into their own virtual meetings and give me a rundown of their academic plan for the week. It, it's just fantastic and mind blowing and I love it. Um, and then sometimes there were students who were really successful on campus and their parents are first responders or nurses or doctors who had to take on crazy shifts and hours and um, military families, all sorts of different families who are so affected by this in different ways. Um, that it really was about helping them make a plan that works best for them and their family in their current circumstances because um, their students, again, they were able to provide a different level of support when they when everything was normal prior to shutdown. Um, and so really working with those families and working with those teachers to make sure, you know, we got some teachers or some students who are really struggling because their parents weren't able to provide that one on one math support that they might normally throughout the year. And so we set up like small groups with those students in particular to make sure that they were still getting extra support as needed and they're thriving as well. Um, we are still holding our student hours, which is really fun. Um, I jumped into our math in fourth grade student hours and the teacher teaching teaching like a normal class. She had her, her, her mini whiteboard and she was demoing as students were asking questions, both verbally and in the chat. Um, it, was, it was so cool to see how that drive is still there with our teachers, even when they can't be in the classroom with our students. Um, we still have our 504 and SPED students who are getting their needs met um, with the one-on-one -on -one small group, dyslexia services, all that good stuff. Our EL coordinator is providing additional support to their students through like, um, I believe they're using Zoom in order to work with the kiddos, password protected. Um, and so we're again, taking all measures to make sure students are safe um, and secure on the internet, making sure we're meeting their individual needs because so much changed that we really, um, had to help our students adapt and our families adapt. 
Yeah, thank you both. Um, I want to highlight just a couple of points that they that they did bring up. Number one, um, if there is a technology need, we will make sure that your students have the technology that they need. So if you don't have an additional laptop or tablet or something like that at home, we will make sure your student is, it has that um, in a hotspot if needed. Um, we are fortunate within um, our Northeast campus, but also throughout the community that we are, we, we've been able to, we will be able to plan ahead um, for that. And so all of the trainings that our teachers kind of learned on the fly um, with what to do, that's built into our on-site training program um, for the teachers that need it, but almost exclusively our teachers are either transfer students within um, our network, about half of our faculty is transferring um, between our schools. Um, or they are um, experienced teachers who are currently doing this, including teachers coming from Japan and China, um, you know, including as part of our network who were doing this for months. Um, I've gotten a number of great emails from them about ways to make sure that we are planning ahead to train the teachers in particularly if needed. Um, so that is part of that. Um, and then to Gabby's note of like live classes and things like that. So a lot of our teachers, we we want the opportunity for live interaction. All of those are also recorded because we know that it's not always possible to get on um, at the exact time that there are those live ones. So the opportunity for asynchronous education is there. Um, and then the student hours, as Stephanie mentioned, it's definitely a plan for there to be normally student hours are offered, you know, once or twice a week by teachers after school um, within this online distance learning platform. I think it's more important to have those opportunities um, even more frequently for that contact to be able to help, whether it's with spelling words or with reading um, more chances to interact with that. So those are going to be available um, on a very regular basis as well. And how how long? I mean, it sounds like the class uh, online class. If if there is a contingency for that, it seems like it's pretty fluid. But uh, what um um how how long are the class periods? Do you guys do them in blocks, or do you guys just jump online on uh, Monday through Friday for thirty minutes a day, and just you know say hi to the kids, read to them a little bit, and then uh, say okay, class is over. We'll we'll meet we'll meet again tomorrow, or is there more of a structured of, uh, online approach? I guess, how long are usually the, the, the sessions? If, uh, if like I guess now, um, using an, exa an example for now, uh, you, you have current teachers that are teaching online. How long are the, uh, the block times for those classes? Um, you know, are they just 30 minutes? Are they an hour? Do you guys meet in the morning and then ask for the students to log back on in the afternoon? I guess just kind of an idea of how how that occurs. So that that's a great question. So it's it's a couple of things. So first of all, it does depend a little bit on the grade level and the class. Um, there will be the schedule will look different depending on whether it's a um, you know we're in person or online. So classes like math, they'll have multiple times a week, if not every single day, a new lesson. Um, and so there is with all of our lessons, typically when it's a live lesson, there's going to be a session that's an I do part, meaning like a little bit more of a showing how to do it. Um, that is where those videos typically come in, where they're engaging the students with, all right, let's show you how to do these pieces. And then there is an opportunity for students to interact and practice those skills. And then there's individual practice time. So that individual practice time is typically not online per se. Um, and so it's not just a reading circle time. There will be a reading circle time, particularly in kinder and first grade. Um, as far as the exact time, we do have engineering and art and things like that too. So it is a little bit different for, per class um, where we want kids continuing to get those. So they are getting multiple classes. So it's not just 30 minutes a day. Typically the video sessions, and Gabby, correct me if I'm wrong here, but typically the video itself as far as the lesson is somewhere between 15 and 15 and 30 minutes, about three times a week for our core classes. Um, in addition to that, there is the individual practice that the students um, receive, so assignments or assessments. Um, and again, that's delivered through Microsoft Teams, um, where there is, again, depending on the age level, it may be due the next day, it may be due two days out or the next week. Um, but that is individual practice. And then um, the student hours, I'm currently planning for our teachers to have at least one hour a day set aside, but that's not lesson time per se. That's a chance, as Stephanie said, for the math teacher to be able to be specifically there for the 
the kid needs a little bit of help. Hey, I'm struggling with this particular question um, or a chance to do something a little bit more informal, like just to read aloud, get an extra exposure. Um, so the exact time, Gabby, I'm going to again let you answer as a parent because you have a first grade um, student right now about I'd say it's what probably about two to three hours a day. Yes, I would I would say I would agree with that uh, two to three hours a day. Um, it sometimes it really does vary. And I really do feel like, you know, this, uh, the way that it's been done has allowed uh, for us to also work with our schedule at home, right? We we can't expect for students, just like Chris mentioned, we can't, it, when I have my live classes, I always record them because I know that I have students that aren't able to to join me at that time. And so it's really important for me to make sure that I have those um, available for the students. And so I'll put those in, those in the assignment so that they know that they can watch over them. Uh, which is uh, actually becomes even more fun for them to he to watch that live session because they can hear their classmates in the black in the background. Um, you know, I always do a sort of a, a little session where like, you know, everybody unmutes themselves and say says hello to everyone. And so it just becomes a little bit more fun. Whenever we have live classes, I will say mine go a little bit longer just because the kids just want to talk and interact with each other. And um, and I do ask for them to collaborate with me with the, uh, you know, helping me with how to solve a problem. And I'll switch back and forth between my cameras to show my whiteboard and they'll like walk me through a problem, which is really nice because then the kids um, I've had the kids even you know come on and say wow that was that was done you know in a great way I really like the way you did it and so they they learn to talk to each other too or if they disagree they come on and say I disagree with that you know which is which is really great that we have those class discussions even through virtual um you know this virtual platform but um my my kids have been able to create a schedule for themselves and I, I will tell you they like literally wrote it down and they would put you know at this time i will have educational time and so they set aside two hours a day um to do to do like to be on teams and then if they need to do additional work like maybe there's like a component where there's a classwork or there's an assignment done, um, then they'll leave time aside for that. So usually about 30 more minutes or so for that. Um, but but then the good thing about it is if they finish within four days and they're like, OK, I have the rest of the days, you know, kind of like free. And so they'll decide to read a book or do other things or uh, be able to attend the student hours with the teachers. Um, and make sure that they're they're um, they're getting the questions out there if they need to. I I can tell you I have some students that just join student hours every Friday with me uh, for that full hour just to they say I just want to be on here and see you and watch you and you know um, and help you go through these problems type of deal. But I got a hundred on my homework, you know, type mm -hmm. of deal. So it's just really them needing that um, interaction with their teachers. Um, and I'll I'll say that for us too. It's about needing that interaction with the students, it's it's um, it's essential for us, right? Um, and so, um, so yeah, I, I would say about about that time frame is definitely in, in those that can uh, be a lot more, you know, that choose to do their schedule and they want to get everything done. I have students that want to get everything done in two or three days and they do, they do, they finish everything and then they're like, okay, what can we do next? You know, and they'll reach out to me. So, I provided opportunities for other things for them to do, other websites and other uh, practices uh, for them to practice like multiplication facts, things like that. Um, and so that's really depends on the teacher as well, which I'm sure all of our teachers will definitely help out with that as well. Um, directly related to that, and I'll answer this one. Do you grade the assignments and give feedback during this distance learning time? Absolutely, yes, 100%. Even more importantly than in a normal setting, um, because in a in a normal setting, we're able to give that feedback in a lot more informal ways. We'll do whiteboards, things like that. Um, it is super important that we are in a timely fashion able to check those assignments and give direct feedback to the students, whether it's spelling, whether it's reading um, with the students. Our LETs, our learning expert teachers get a lot of one on one time or small group time with the kiddos right now um, to do things like that. But then also giving direct feedback on the math assignments. It's even more important than the normal for us to be able to grade them quickly, turn them around and get them back to the students so that they know where that mistake might be and they may figure out where they made the mistake and they may not. And that's where the student hours come in and opportunities to get those questions answered. So yes, 100% we grade the assignments and we give feedback. I know actually our English teachers have been excited in a lot of ways because they've gotten to do some more writing because they're able to be able to have a little bit more time to give more feedback. Um, that's always one of the tricks with English and history is 
when, when you do writing, it's how quickly can I get this turned around? And they've actually been able to to do more writing um, in particular with that kind of thing. So um, yes, 100%, we grade the assignments, we give feedback, and we're continuing to learn. And that will absolutely be the case um, during, um, if, if we have to do that, and again, we don't want to, but we will do whatever the CDC says. Um, and as far as that goes. Um, and then I also wanna highlight for everybody, um, one of the things is, all of our classes are continuing. It's not just reading and math. Engineering is part of our curriculum. Art is part of our curriculum. Phonics is part of our curriculum. Drama and music and PE, those are part of our curriculum. We 100% believe in educating the whole child um, and all of those classes have continued during distance learning. Um, classes that they only you typically have once a week like art, they typically are still only getting one lesson a week, but I know our students are engaging in that material and that's a key part of our curriculum that has continued along with the PE part of the curriculum and the math part of the curriculum. So when we're talking that we want to make sure that the kids are getting all of that. Um, and Lily, you're most welcome. That's our problem now with the current school with no feedback. I'm sorry that that's going on. Um, I wish you were getting feedback because I think it's invaluable at this time. It's not just review. It's the kids need that feedback and during this virtual way, it's even more important that we're giving them that feedback in paper form or in one-on-one -on -one meetings or in small group meetings to talk about what are they doing and how are they struggling with it. Um, but giving them that feedback, I think is super important. So sorry that you're not getting that. Um, you will get it with us, I promise you. <laughs> and I wanna jump in real quick on that, um, Chris, uh, for the question that Lily uh, mentioned about uh, the feedback. So something that we do have with teams um, that I really like is when we do have our assignments that are sent out to our students, they work on it. And then when we return that to them, we have the capability to add in a comment. And I can tell you, I mean, I, I am after this meeting, I'm going to sit down and look through all the things that the kids uh, sent in this week and, um, and, and make sure that I have feedback on those. Um, I go through them one by one and I do uh, make sure that I notice, you know, if there are some some discrepancies and so, or some some things that are commonly missed, um, then I'll address that to the whole class. Um, especially if I notice that um, there was something that that maybe they missed all as a whole. Um, obviously, that's something I would have done in the classroom as well. Whenever we do those, you know, informal assessments, if we notice that there was something that they missed, then we want to make sure that they understand it. And so I've done. I mean, I've done a, a follow up video uh, before. Like, oh, I noticed this is something we didn't understand. So I'm just. Uh, you know, putting this out so that you guys can understand it. Um, and I do have a lot of, um, you know, feedback on that from the students. They'll say, oh, thank you for doing that. I didn't understand it. Or, you know, or they'll reach out to me and say, you know, I don't understand. We were working on two digit by two digit multiplication already towards the end of the year. Um, and so that was something that the kids wanted more practice with. And I said, absolutely, let's do a session. And, you know, I just created a live session and whoever can join, uh, they joined and anybody that could not join at that point, then we just recorded the session and the kids were able to watch it. Um, but that feedback is really important for them, but not only for them, I feel also for the parents. Um, they, as a parent, you're able to go in and look at all of the assignments that are being returned with feedback. Um, but also I, I noticed, um, so I know that there are parents that, you know, they are allowing the students to do their work. And, and that's how I started noticing if there was like a decline in grades or anything like that. I will contact the parent directly just so that they are aware of that, because sometimes um, that's that's where, you know, we are we can't make assumptions that the, the parents are also checking the teams. Um, and so I, I have contacted parents and they're like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, you know, I I was just kind of trusting that they were doing their work. Thank you for letting me know or you know, whether that was a, an allowing them to retake a quiz or uh, especially if it was a really low grade on a test or a quiz, um, you know, trying to follow those those uh, policies that we have in place either way, in a way uh, with them. Um, so I have definitely done that as well for them. If they have gotten low test scores, tell the parents first because they probably don't know um, and definitely talk to the students about it too to see if they need additional help. Um, so I know we are well over but if there are any more questions i am happy to stay on the line but um, i know people are going to have to jump off so i want to say thank you to everybody but i am happy to stay on as long as there are continuing to be questions so um, but thank you all for those of you who do have to go thank you for joining us today if you do have any questions please reach out um, after this 
But again, I'll, I, I will absolutely stay on the line to make sure I answer any other questions that there are. Uh, uh, I do appreciate your time, sir. The uh, information session has been uh, very helpful and informative and to also the, uh, the, the teachers that are also responding as well. Um, you know, especially when when you talked about the uh, the science aspect um, of having uh, uh, science uh, in in first grade and all that, and I'm pretty sure it's uh, it's fun and informative and all that good stuff. So um, that's uh, that's uh, I, I look forward to 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 that, um, but I also thank the teachers too for taking the time and and uh, I'm pretty sure you guys probably had some class of some sort today so just wanted to thank you for taking the time out to be able to be to, to respond to our questions as well it was our pleasure absolutely and yes i'm with you that science literacy course is something i'm really excited about um as is our teacher for that miss van lu who is also entered our engineering teacher so um it's really exciting for us but yes i know they do have to um gabby's got endless comments to be able to make on all of those student uh, assignments and everything like that but thank you very much Thank you.